everybody. Morning. So we are continuing in week three in our James series, Hall of Faith That Works. And I will be reading from James chapter one, verses 19 through 26. If you're using the paper Bible like me, I'm going to flip to page 1071. Give you guys a second to get there. James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer who works... This person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this word. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be with you guys. Um, my name is Justin. I'm the director of our college ministry here at the church. And um, yeah, really thankful for this opportunity to preach God's word this morning. Uh, thankful to be with this people, this congregation, and um, to get to share something that has uh, really humbled me this past week in preparation. Uh, I was, it was like 1130 on Friday night. I was working on this and I was about two thirds of the way done. And I was spending some time in prayer, and God met me in that moment, and I ended up rewriting the whole sermon. And so it might be a little non-traditional in the way we work through this text, but I just want you to know that this sermon began with me. Um, and I'm praying that God would work in the same way in your lives, that it would start with you, and that I would, it would infect our communities in our church, and and that it would result in the world being changed. So, uh, as Nicole read, we're going to be in uh, verses 19 to 27, (laughs) Um, and, uh, but I want to start in verses 22 to 25, Um, because if we don't get these verses, and what James has to say to us in verses 22 to 25, then anything else that James has to say in this passage and anything else that I have to say to you today will mean absolutely nothing. So listen to what James says in verse 22 to 25. He says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. I'm going to read it one more time. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Frankly, there are many verses in the Bible 
that don't need much elaboration. They don't need much explanation. They don't need a preacher to make clear what they mean. They're simple. They're clear. They're direct. And this is one of those verses. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So I ask you this morning, Blueprint, did you come into this place prepared to do what the word of God asks you to do? Are you prepared to hear God's word, receive it into your ears and into your heart by the spirit of God, leave this door, go home and apply it today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, next Monday, next Tuesday, and every day for the rest of our lives. Because according to this text, if we're not, then we're wasting our time. It would be better for me to shut this Bible, walk off the stage, get in my car, and go home than to continue to speak to you about what God calls us to do if we do not intend to do it. James says we're deceiving ourselves if we hear, but we do not obey. My fear is that maybe this morning and many other Sunday mornings, some of us, maybe me included, we come in here and we sing some songs and we listen to some good teaching and we clap our hands and we say amen and then we go on about our Sundays and plan to do nothing further with what we've heard. And James is so clear with us that this is not consistent with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Even Jesus is, is clear with us about this. I would encourage you, go read the Sermon on the Mount and then come back and read the book of James. They're kind of like parallel texts to one another. James just uses these words that kind of hook you back into the Sermon on the Mount, nearly chapter after chapter after chapter. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's just finished teaching about what it looks like for his kingdom to come on the earth and for the people who belong to his kingdom to live out his kingdom way. And he says this in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. What's the difference between... These men, the wise man and the foolish man. It's not hearing the word. They both heard it. They both received it. Maybe they both delighted in it. Maybe they both said this was good. But the wise man, he acted on it. And it says that his house stood. His house endured. His house flourished even in the midst of the storm. But the wise man did nothing. And his house collapsed. James would say it this way. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. That's why we have mirrors on the stage. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. Right, we go to mirrors to see ourselves, see if we have food in our teeth, if our hair is messed up, if our shirts are misbuttoned, all kinds of things. If we see those things, walk away and be like, yeah, I'm good, I'm ready to go. It's like, that's, that's ridiculous. You see yourself like, oh, did I have food in my teeth? It's like, how did you forget that? You looked in the mirror, you saw yourself, and you walked away, and you did nothing. James says that's foolishness. Jesus says to hear my word and do nothing with it is foolishness. James wants to help us understand and know that there is nothing more dangerous than knowing the whole Bible, hearing thousands of sermons, 
listening to a ton of your favorite podcasts about the Bible to make things crystal clear, but never obeying one verse of it. See, we live in a digital age where we have access to probably millions of sermons and podcasts. We have thousands of translations of the English Bible. We have free study tools all over the place that give us access to commentators and original Hebrew and the original Greek and all of these things. And it can be very easy for us to grow comfortable hearing God's word, studying God's word, and even enjoying God's word, yet rarely finding ourselves obeying it. See, if we were to just flip back in our Bibles to the Psalms and we were to go Psalm 119, it is a 176-verse psalm or poem that's all about God's law. And it's beautiful. It's like a poem comprised of a bunch of little poems. And in there, you hear all kinds of words about, all the kinds of descriptors about God's word, how delightful it is and how wonderful it is, and that it's sweeter than honey and more valuable than gold. Don't get me wrong this morning. We should delight in God's word. It should be like honey to our lips. It should be more valuable to us than gold. This is true. We should hear it. We should study it. We should learn it. We should memorize it. It tells us to do some of those things. But at least from what I could count, and there were some words that I didn't include that probably mean obeying, 49 verses out of 176, that's about 28%, that's over a quarter of them, talked about obeying, talked about keeping, talked about following, talked about not turning away from the word of God. So yes, God's word is to be delighted in, 100%, but God's word is also to be delightfully obeyed. So this morning, what I want us to know above all else is that both knowing and obeying God's word is the true pathway to living. It is the pathway to true living. Look what James says in verse 25. It says, But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. In other words, James says to us, obedience to the perfect law of freedom equals blessedness, which is another word for flourishing which is another word for truly living. Now let me make a point of clarity. I am not calling us this morning to just moral obedience. No, this morning I'm calling us to total surrender to King Jesus. I'm not calling you to just moral obedience, that moral obedience leads to the blessed life. No, 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 no. Total surrender to King Jesus leads to the blessed life. And that includes obedience to him. See, in verse 18, this is where Pastor Carly ended last week. It says that God is a good giver of gifts. And by his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of the truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures God in his kindness has given us new birth. He's made us alive through Christ, through the Spirit of God. See, Jesus came, he died, he resurrected, and he's ascended to the right hand of God. And he has sent his Spirit into the world to empower his followers who've been made alive by him to carry out his will on the earth. He's brought us from death to life. And by his Spirit, he's implanted his word into us. Look at verse 21. This is therefore ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, right? That's what the Spirit does. He makes us alive and causes us to live in a new way. He says, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. That phrase, implanted word, is basically like instruction given from a teacher. In Jeremiah 31, 31 and Ezekiel 36, it says that God's going to do a going to give a, a create, establish a new covenant with his people, and he's going to pour his spirit into them. And his spirit's going to write his law on their hearts, and it will cause them to keep it and to never turn away from it. And when they do this, that they will flourish, and they will, they will live. The word of God has been implanted in our hearts. 
The word of God has been written on our hearts. This perfect law that leads to freedom. Which can be synonymous with the word of God, but can also be synonymous later in James chapter 2. He's going to say, he's going to talk about this royal law, which is basically Jesus' summation of all the law and the prophets, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He says the one who looks intently into this law and all the specificities of the various commands that we get throughout the Bible on how to love God and love our neighbor, the one who looks into this and does this, they experience blessedness. They experience flourishing. They experience true life. So hear me this morning. These commands that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes are not moral obligations but they're an invitation into the way of King Jesus that leads to true life and flourishing. There's no greater narrative in the Bible that helps us see this than the Exodus narrative. See, the Exodus narrative is you find the people of God in the land of Egypt, and they're enslaved to an oppressive and a destructive king. And they're groaning, and God hears their groans, and he hears their cries, and he sends his servant Moses to bring them out. And he brings them out of the land of Egypt through wondrous acts of judgment, which we call plagues. And he brings them through the Red Sea in a miraculous act of splitting the water. And they walk through, and they get to the other side, and they find themselves on Mount Horeb and then Mount Sinai. And God tells them, hey, you are my people, and I am your God. In other words, I'm your king now. I've delivered you from the the oppressive, destructive king, and I'm bringing you to the true, good king who desires to bring you into a, a place of freedom and a place of rest and a place of life and a place of flourishing. And so what he does is he says, here's my law. And he gives them the law. And he says, I know you had a way of life in Egypt, but I have a new way for you that leads to life. And what you see is that when the people of God are obedient to the law of God, they flourish. They live, and not only them, but their blessedness and their flourishing begins to spill out into the world around them. And it's when they abandon God as king, and they disregard his law, and they entrust themselves to other kings and to idols, it's then that they perish. It's then that they're exiled. It's then that they're enslaved. It's then that they're destroyed. And Jesus picks up into this narrative. This is the narrative of the New Testament. Beginning in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus comes on the scene after his temptation in the wilderness. And he says he went around teaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the true king is here to to bring my people out of oppression, to bring my people out of exile, to bring my people out of death into a way and into a land that is flourishing and good and true. To which then sets us up for the Sermon on the Mount. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. And so live into it. And so Jesus was clear. Whoever hears my words and does them. This is the wise one. This is the flourishing one. We need to understand there is no vision within the scriptures of God of flourishing apart from total surrender to King Jesus. And part of what it means to be surrendered to him is that we obey him. James began the text this way, and I, I loved that Pastor Carly started with this. He said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus the Christ. In other words, James says, my primary identity is that I'm a servant to the king. Whatever he does, I do it because he's good. And he wants good for me. He has life and he wants life for me. He has freedom and he has freedom for me. He desires to bring us into a place of rest, of freedom, of blessedness, of flourishing. Following Jesus is the way to true life. Do we believe that this morning? So I'll ask you again. Are you here to listen to and obey God's word? If so, then there are going to be three things that James 
is going to call us to be obedient to this morning. Three things. Controlling the tongue, looking after the widow and the orphan, and keeping ourselves unstained from the world. Controlling the tongue, looking after the widow and the orphan, and keeping ourselves unstained from the world. I'm going to move through these kind of quickly, the best that I can. Because really verses 19 to 27 is kind of like a table of contents for the rest of the book of James. Which you're gonna, he's going to introduce some things here, and there's some really direct commands, and we need to consider those, we need to obey those. But he's going to give some more full treatment to some of these ideas later in the book of James. So like he's, when he talks about caring for the widow and the orphan, he's going to talk about caring for the poor in chapter 2. When he talks about controlling the tongue, he's going to give a full treatment on how we use our tongue and how that relates to our relationships with our brothers and sisters in the body in chapter 3, and, and it'll bleed into chapter 4. And then even keeping yourselves unstained from the world, there's going to be a big call to repentance in chapter 4. So let's start with controlling the tongue. Listen to verses 19 and 20 and verse 26. So my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Verse 26. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. So what James is going to do is he's going to pull from both Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and he's going to pull from the wisdom tradition of the scriptures which we find in the book of Proverbs which in our language is in the Old Testament. And he's going to fuse these two things together and he's going to drop a little proverb as, of his own kind of at the end. But I want to start with what Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 5. Listen to these words. He says, You have heard it, uh, you, excuse me, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. And then he continues on to talk about a pursuit of reconciliation. So what Jesus does right off the bat is he, he equates human anger, hatred, the kind of anger that destroys relationships with murder. And not only that, he ties these things, this expression of anger, particularly to the tongue. He says, you who insult your brother are subject to the courts. You who say, you fool, is subject to judgment. Notice he, he equates anger with the tongue. A tongue that's out of control does lead to destruction and destruction of relationship. And so later in James chapter 4, he says, James says to them, he says, you murder and you covet. He said, what's the source of these wars and these stripes among you? What's he saying? There's some commentators that actually think that they were like murdering one another. But I, I think it's interesting that this is positioned right after where he talks about the tongue. And where he would equate the use of our words in the same way that Jesus talks about human anger and, the, and murder. The way we use our tongues and the anger that flows out of our hearts, through our mouths, into the ears and the lives of other people, it can be destructive. It's murderous. But not only that, like I said, he pulls from the wisdom tradition of the scriptures. So things like Proverbs 13, 3, it says, those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. See, the fool in Proverbs is the one who just is a yapper. They just go on and on and on and on. You're like, please, be quiet. But here it says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. So James takes these two things and he brings them together in a beautiful sentence that is very easily memorizable. 
everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. I tell you, th- these, this, this makes a lot of sense. You want to you wanna pick a fight with someone? You want to get someone inclined towards human anger? Put them in a place where they don't feel heard or understood. You want to spark some tension? Be somebody that just never stops talking. Be somebody who's quick to clap back. Be somebody who's always on the defensive, I promise you. People will have tension with you. There will be destruction in relationship. There will be distance in relationship because you're someone you can't even have a conversation with. You're just running your mouth and going and going and going. James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. There's a lot more to be said about the tongue, and we're going to get to that when we get to chapter 3, so I don't want to belabor this point. But to help us get some handlebars around this command this morning, and and I'm I'm setting these things up. Every point, there's going to be very specific application questions that we need to ask ourselves and consider and then go do. I'm trying to put us in the best position to not be hearers but to be doers. So when I ask you these questions, I want you to go ask somebody these things this week or go pursue these things this week. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is around being quick to listen. You can put in parentheses and slow to speak. Would the people who know you best characterize you as a good listener? Maybe the person knows you best is your wife or your husband. Maybe it's your friend. Maybe it's somebody in your city group. Maybe it's a parent or a family member. Whoever that is probably should be multiple people, but I would ask them. Hey, would you say I'm a good listener? Why or why not? And let them speak to you about that. Because you might think you're a good listener, and then they go, no, you're not. You just talk. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Point number two, slow to anger. Same kind of question. Would the people who know you best characterize you as someone who's angry or easily angered? Or would they characterize you as someone who's kind, peaceful, gentle, and gracious? See, now some of you might hear that and go, well, you know, maybe I'm not that angry. I like what Brian Loritz says about anger. He says there's two faces of anger, two faces to anger. One is explosive. It's big. It's expressive. It's the yelling. It's the verbal assaulting. It's the cussing out. It's sharp, and it leaves deep wounds. Like you see it, like, what are you doing? Like you can see in my face that I'm angry. Some of you are like, ah, I'm not like that. And that's okay, because if you're not like that, then... Maybe you're like this. Maybe you're like the silent assassin. Somebody wrongs you, you go, okay. That's how it's going to be? All right, watch this. And you just retreat inside. And you get cold. And you get hard. And you get distant. Whether you're explosive whether you're a silent assassin, they're both deadly. They're both murderous. And they're not only destructive to your relationships, but they're they're destructive to you. Have you ever met, like, a, a person that's, like, truly flourishing who's just consumed with anger? Or even somebody that's quick to anger. Like, they're just not, they don't seem to be doing well. Like they're just bitter, they're just frustrated all the time. Like, that's not the flourishing life. Whether you're explosive or whether you're silent, these things are destructive, and they don't accomplish the righteousness of God. They don't bring about peace. They don't bring about harmony. They don't bring about unity. They don't bring about reconciliation. They bring about division and strife and what Jesus would call 
So James calls us to be a people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, that we might be a people who are peaceful and gentle and harmonious. And even in the midst of conflict, when we're slow to speak and quick to listen, that we might actually find ourselves having reconciled relationships with people. That's what we're being called into this morning. So may God help us do that. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let's get to point number two. Looking after the widow and the orphan. Verse 27. It says, pure, reli- pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I know we don't like the word religion. We have a phrase. We say here a lot of blueprint. Christianity is not about religion. It's about relationships. But James has something to say about that. He says, actually, you're a part of a religion. Because a religion is just a system of meanings by, or meaning by which people make sense of life. And how they decide what leads to life and death. And what really matters in life. And what brings purpose to life. In one way or another, everybody's religious. The follower of Jesus is religious. The Muslim is religious. The Hindu is religious. The atheist has a way of system of thinking that determines right or wrong. The naturalist does. You might not call it religion, but it is. And there is only one that is pure, and that is accepted by God. And it's this. It's two things, and the first one is that we would look after orphans and widows in their distress. James is going to unpack a lot more of this in chapter 2. And he's going to talk a lot more about than than just specifically widows and orphans, although he does say specifically widows and orphans here. When he gets to chapter 2, he's just going to broaden that category to the poor, to the widow, the orphan, the poor, the oppressed, the vulnerable. Right, A widow being someone who's without a husband by death or divorce. The orphan being someone who is fatherless and or motherless, without someone to care for them, without someone to protect them without someone to provide for them. And while I won't go on and on and on about this point, because we're going to talk about it more in the coming weeks, I do want to address some of it. One, because James is calling us to to be obedient to it here, but also because as we look around our city, and even if we were just to walk outside these doors, it does not take us long to find depression does not take us long to find the impoverished. It does not take us long to find injustice. We can also look around our world and our city, and we can see injustices that are caused by flaws in the systems of our world. And those are real things. And God cares about those things. He, He is actually the giver of ruling authorities, of governments that are actually put in place and they're designed to be people who carry out justice and pursue equity amongst the people in the world. But we've seen time and time and time again that they fail. And so God is concerned about those systems. But don't get me wrong, God is not waiting for those systems necessarily to be Uh, um, repaired before the widow and the orphan and the oppressed and the poor are cared for. Now what God has done is he's not created another system, but he's created a people. And that people is called the church. And that's comprised of anybody who is a follower of Jesus, who is trusting in him, who gives their allegiance to him, who is surrendered to him, who follows him and who is planning to obey him. In other words, people who are surrendered to the king and are a part of his kingdom. And what God is doing is he's employing those people to look after, or some of your translations may say visit, 
the widow and the orphan, the vulnerable and the overlooked, and those that are suffering injustice in our world. Now, you might be like, okay, what does it mean to visit? Does that mean just go knock on their door and say hello? Does that mean to just kind of stop by and hang out for a little while and dip? Not quite. I like how David Flatt defines this. He says visiting means going to them, caring for them, taking responsibility for their well-being, raising them up, bringing them out, and giving them life. You want to see what the epitome of visiting is? Look at the life of Jesus. See, Jesus came to us. John would say, the word became flesh in dwelt among us. He built a tent among us. He lived among us. He cared for us. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He brought hearing to the deaf. He fed thousands of people that followed him and were hungry. He took responsibility for their well-being. And ultimately, he rose us up by first laying himself down on a cross where he died. in the ultimate place of oppression, in the ultimate place of shame, in the ultimate place of being cast out. And then he was buried, and then three days later, he was risen from the grave so that anybody who would trust in him, anybody that would follow him, anybody that would place their faith and their life in him would be raised with him out of the place of shame, out of the place of dishonor, out of the place of oppression, to be seated at the right hand of God. It says in Ephesians 2 that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, brought from the place of extreme shame to the place of highest honor. This is who we are, church, this morning. But let us not be so proud to think that when we take serious this command and take our feet out into the streets to obey Jesus and care for the widow and the orphan and the poor that we think we are the saviors. No, no, no. We are just the vessels through which the Savior is working through. So yes, we might bring his kingdom. Yes, we might bring his care. Yes, we might bring his love. Yes, we might bring his hospitality. Yes, we might bring his honor to people who do not currently have it and otherwise will not or might not. But all the while, we point and say, no, 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 we're not the Savior's Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the one who's compelling me to be here with you in this moment, and it is my delight. So the question this morning is not, will we look after the widow and the orphan? The question this morning is, how will we look after the widow and the orphan? I do not have a one-size-fix-all answer. I'm going to give you a list of things that's probably just scratching the surface. But my hope is that as you hear this list, that it might, the Spirit of God might use it to creatively move you to see the world around you, to see the oppression, the injustice, those that are suffering around you, and to step into their world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so for some of us, what it would look like to visit or care for the widow, the orphan, the vulnerable, or the oppressed is to actually get involved in local policy and advocate for people that are being oppressed by broken systems and call those things to be fixed. For some of us, it might look like volunteering at local schools that are deeply underfunded and people who have no education and have no hope of ever leaving their neighborhoods or their homes and getting wrapped up into all kinds of destructive things, we can step into their lives and help educate them and mentor them and invest our time and our money and our resources to give them opportunities to go places where they otherwise would not go. For some of us, it might look like volunteering at a local food shelter. For some of us, it might look like coming on Thursday afternoons in the parking lot and serving at the Blueprint Food Drive. For some of us, it might look like maybe you're someone who goes to the food drive here this morning. One way you can be involved in caring for the poor that you see is maybe just by inviting them to come with you. For some of us, it might look like giving money or clothes. For some of us, it might look like opening up our spare bedrooms or our kitchen tables. For some of us, it might look like pursuing adoption or getting involved in the foster care system. 
For some of us, it might look like going to nursing homes and sitting with people who are on the last leg of their life begging for a friend. And for some of us, it might look like stewarding our professions, our skills, to be a blessing to people who otherwise can't afford things like legal work or medical work or even to get a haircut. I think one of the things I'd love to see at our our church over the last number of years is we've done a a medical drive for the last number of years, and there have been doctors in this church, there have been therapists in this church, there have been dentists in this church, there have been barbers and other people with professions like that in this church who have come and they've cared for people who can't afford things for free. So this morning I encourage you to do two things. One, look around. Where do you see the vulnerable? Where do you see the widow? Where do you see the orphan? Where do you see the vulnerable? Where do you see injustice? And then when you see those things, too, prayerfully pursue getting involved. And by that, I don't mean pray about it for two weeks and do nothing. By that, I mean pray while you take steps into these spaces and ask God, God, What would you have me to do here? Who is the person I need to connect with here? What family do I need to prioritize in this space? Pray while we seek out the opportunity, the information, the next steps to get involved in these things. That's what pure religion looks like. Visiting the widow and the orphan, and lastly, it looks like keeping ourselves unstained from the world. See, in a lot of ways, One calls us to be people who are concerned about the wider world, as some might call social justice. And this one calls us to what some might call personal holiness. Depending on the tradition that you may have grown up in in the church, some of your traditions may have heralded a lot of the social justice stuff but cared very little about personal holiness. Some have said, we love personal holiness, but we don't give a rip about social justice. And James says, "Uh, both of those categories are trash. We fit right in the middle. We care about social justice, and we care about personal holiness. That's what pure religion is. That is what is acceptable to the Father. So, we've talked about the social realities of this. Now let's talk about the personal ones. What does it look like to keep ourselves unstained from the world? Well, firstly, what is the world? The world is, I'll give you two definitions. One is by Jerry Brashears. It says, the world is Satan's domain where his authority and his values reign, though his deception makes that hard to realize. If you are of the world, then all seems right. John Mark Comer defines the world as a system of ideas, values, morals, practices, and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a culture corrupted by the two twin sins Rebellion against God in the redefinition of good and evil. All that I'm trying to say to you this morning is that the world has a definition for what true religion and true living is. And that definition is 100% contrary to what God says. But what's interesting about this is that it just has a very subtle way of putting it before you in a very subtle way of forming you, not into the image of God to carry out this pure and undefiled religion, but to be formed into the system and the image of the world that would give no time to it. And so I want to ask you this morning, how is the world forming you? Because it is. Right? This is it's, it's like the, the air we breathe. You know, you ever been in a car with somebody? And you got you know, your friends over here, and you're like, some start smelling bad. You're like, dude, did you pass gas? He's like, nah, I didn't do that. And he's like, must just be in the air. Right, it just hits you. It's like, you didn't, even, you didn't even know that it was smelly outside. It just hits you. It's impacting you. It's infecting you. Right, and he didn't even smell it. That's how it is to be in the world. Except sometimes we're like our friends. We don't even... Smell it. There's a lot of ways that the world goes about forming us, but there's two things I'll ask you about here. One 
is uh, what are the ads? And yes, I mean ads like advertisements. What are the advertisements that you see? That these things are shaping us. Maybe you see them on TV. Maybe you see them on YouTube. Maybe you see them driving down the road. And secondly, like, what are they telling you about what true living is? I had the other day, I'll give us two examples. One that's maybe a little light and one that's kind of serious. I'm driving down 75 every day to come up here. And on the right by the Georgia State Stadium is a big billboard with a Sprite can on it. And it says, obey your thirst. And I just, I've been looking at it every day. And then one day it kind of hit me and I was like, oh, snap, I get it. You're trying to tell me that when I'm thirsty, I should drink Sprite, not water. Okay, you're trying to form me to do something, to buy something, to be a particular way. Or how about this one? Ladies, I don't mean to be uh, offensive, but I want to be real this morning. I was preparing for this sermon, and I was watching uh, something on YouTube where someone was actually defining this point, what it looks like to care for the widow and the orphan and to be unstained by the world. And I clicked on the video, and popped up, uh, an ad popped up, and it was this woman and she was in, like, some sleepwear, which was mildly revealing. And, she, and the first words out of her mouth was, do you know how to F with women? And I was like, what? What is he talking about? And she was like, do you know how to flirt with them? Do you want that pretty girl by your side? And I was like, okay, skip. <laughs> I just skipped it. <laughs> I, said, I, I don't want to hear any more of this. And I paused the video. And I said, God, would you keep me from things? that would cause me to degrade women in the world and degrade sisters in Christ. Because what that ad just called me to do was to do exactly that. It's trying to form me to think that masculinity is about being overly flirtatious with women, seeing them as objects and having them by my side to show off to the world. And that is furthest from the truth of how Jesus calls us to honor men to women and women to men, to honor, to uphold, to respect. So what are the ads that you see and what are they telling you about the world? And then secondly, I want to ask you, what are the things that you do during the day or at night? What do you watch? What do you listen to? What do you talk about? How often do you pick up your phone? When you do pick your phone up, what are you doing with it? These little habits, these little things, they're forming you. And they're forming you one of two ways, either into the image of Jesus or into the system of the world. And the thing we need to be careful is is that it's subtle. It's kind of like eating a hot dog with mustard on it. You take a bite, and it drips down on your shirt, and you don't even know it, and you finish it, and you look down, and you're like... I got mustard on my shirt. But if you think about some of these things, it's like every time you do one thing, do another, and again, don't hear me, I'm not anti-technology, okay? I got an iPad, I have an iPhone, I got an Xbox, okay? I was on YouTube the other day, like, you know, I, I have some digital things that I do, okay? But there might be some things that we do need to abstain from. Because when we bite, it's, if it's like a hot dog with mustard on it, every time we bite, it drips down to our shirt. We don't look down. We don't realize that we look down, and what once was a white shirt is suddenly a totally different color. And at best, it's splotchy. It's ruined. The world has subtle deceptions that over time can cause us to look far more like the world than to look like Jesus to walk far more in a false definition of, what, of religion than a true one according to God's word. And so this morning to close, I want to read you something from a book. It's called Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. I would recommend it to you. It talks about the world, the flesh, and the devil, the three enemies to your soul. So I was reading his section on the world. And um, he talks about a book from an early church historian, and it reads like this. It says, the late Dr. Larry Hurtado, historian of early Christianity, in his wildly celebrated book, Destroyer of the Gods, told the story of how a tiny Jewish sect of Jesus followers overcame the bastion of paganism and won over the Roman Empire in only a few centuries. 
His thesis was that it wasn't the church's relevance or relatability to the culture, but its difference and distinctness that made it compelling to so many. The church was marked by five distinctive features, all of which stand out against the backdrop of the empire, the Roman Empire, which, if I'm honest, is an empire that's kind of like ours. The first distinction is this. The church was multiracial and multiethnic with a high value for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Number two, the church was spread across socioeconomic lines as well. And there was a high value for caring for the poor. Those with extra were expected to share with those with less. Three, it was staunch in its active resistance to infanticide and abortion. Infanticide was a practice where people who didn't want their children would just take them and leave them in a field to die. Four, it was resolute in its vision of marriage and sexuality as between one man and one woman for life. And five, it was nonviolent, both on a personal level and a political level. What's interesting about what Comer says through a quote from Dr. Hurtado is that this church was distinct and that this church changed the world. And what's interesting about this list of things is that the first three values that we see that this church held dearly and were faithful to be obedient to Jesus into are actually three things that we see Jesus calling us to be obedient to this morning. See, number one, they were a multiracial and multiethnic church. They had to learn how to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger to be with people that were from all kinds of different cultures and places in the world. Point number two, they were spread across socioeconomic lines. They had a high value for the poor. They took serious this call to visit the widow and the orphan, the vulnerable, the oppressed. And third, we see they had a staunch resistance to things like infanticide. When you see a baby left to die out in the field, that is the definition of an orphan. And they prided themselves on picking up those babies and raising them as their own. And it said that it changed the world. We're a church who believes that the gospel changes people and people change the world. And we see that God used people who were not hearers of the word, but they were doers to change the world in the first century. And the reality is God is still in the business of changing the world today. The question is, will we be obedient to him? So it's at this time that I'm going to give us a really simple...